Today's Animal Spirits is brought to you by our friends at YCharts. One of the things YCharts does besides give you the ability to search out different graphs and charts and data and information is they actually provide a bunch of uh, visuals for you, for advisors especially. So they have this 2023 Q1 Econ deck, and they run this quarterly economic update every quarter, which would make sense. It'd be weird if they ran it quarterly and it was called quarterly and they did it monthly. Uh, a bunch of good charts in here. I want to talk about some. Uh, first one, they have mortgage. They they have all these different charts on one page. Mortgage rates and originations. So it shows thirty year mortgage, and then mortgage originations, uh, and then refinancing as a share of this. And as you can see, as rates have gone up, mortgage originations have just gone in the toilet. We're going to talk about this today for real estate today. Uh, here's another good one. It's the S&P 500 versus the 10-2 Treasury yield spread. So this is just the difference between the 10-year Treasury and the two-year Treasury. And you can see here, any time in the past, I don't know, 30 years, when the yield curve is inverted, it's done so like a minuscule amount. This is a big one. It hasn't been this big since 1980, 1980, 1981. You mean the two the two year the two year is yielding 100 basis points more than the 10 year, or was? Yes, which is pretty yeah, wild. Yeah, it's pretty it's pretty close. It's come back in a little bit, but it's it's a huge huge spread. Anyway, there's a bunch of other good charts like this. If you want to want to check it out, go to our show notes. There will be a link in there where you can download it. Just give them your email. And if you want to sign up for Y Charts, tell them Animal Spirit sent you. You get 20% off that initial subscription. Welcome to Animal Spirits with Michael and Ben. That uh, there's a new jingle in your ear. We got new new show tunes. It's a new and improved Animal Spirits. We started this show in 20 late 2017 and. We might have told a little bit of this about this before, but it's good to go back. We thought we were going to edit this show ourselves. It, there was podcasts around, but it, it was not the tools weren't as much as we have today, and we didn't know what we were doing. Finally, we asked for some help from some other podcasters and said, "What are we doing? We're we're wasting our time here. We're spinning our wheels." And a bunch of people, I think Meb Faber and Patrick O'Shaughnessy, put us in touch with Matthew Passy, who is a podcast producer for a few finance programs, and he basically laid out everything we need to do. Here's the equipment you need to get. Here's the software you need to get. Here's the mics, everything. Here's what you need to sign up for. Here's how you upload it. I'm going to do this for you. And he's been our producer for the past five plus years. And we never would have got the podcast off the ground without him. He, I remember the first time we did a talk your book, he had to come to New York from New Jersey to help us. We've <laughs> had right. countless emails and phone calls with him to yeah. help. And he's, he's brought us along this journey with, and again, without him, we could have never done it. He's helped us with equipment and producing. Uh, and we had a mutual breakup recently. Matthew uh, built a successful business. Uh, we have a, a production team in house that we're now using. Duncan and John and Nicole are helping out with this. And it just kind of made sense. And now, so that means for us, we have a new, new read at the beginning, we have new music. And I don't think I've ever heard you talk about music once in your life. Uh, if someone said like, what's Michael's favorite kind of music? I, I, I wouldn't know what to say. I don't think you'd listen to music maybe, but when Josh oh, played us some, <laughs> I, I don't it. know. I, I probably, I'm probably similar though. Music is not like my big thing anymore, but, uh, Josh played us some, some music in the office the other day and I couldn't tell if it was serious or a joke. Uh, you were immediately out and, but I think we're, we're no, 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 that was, on. that was, that song was literally a joke. Uh, yeah. no, but yes. So I grew up, my dad, uh, was playing classic rock for me. So Zeppelin, Jethro, those sort of bands. Okay, my first concert was my first, my first, yes, my first concert was Meatloaf, Bad Out of Hell, 1994, <laughs> at, 1994 at MSG. Okay. Um, anyway, it. yeah, we, we cannot thank Matthew enough. He's been tremendous. If anybody is starting a podcast, they're still up and running. Um, he's uh, just been an incredible partner for us. So Matthew, thank you for everything that you've done for us. And we're excited about having the capabilities with, with Duncan and the team to be able to control our own destiny. So very exciting times for us. All right, one more housekeeping item before we get started with the show. Ben and I are going to be speaking, doing a live Animal Spirits on Monday, May 22nd at the Wealthstack Conference in Hollywood, Florida, which uh, I guess is like sort of by Fort Lauderdale, it's between Fort Lauderdale and Miami, maybe. It's in that vicinity. It's on the, it's on the East Coast of Miami. Uh, I'm Florida, excuse me. It's Actually, Florida, that's all I care about. Actually, I'm kind of freaking out a little bit because I said yes to this sort of not really thinking about the fact that the Knicks actually are playing in my in uh, in in the in May, which is something oh. that was never never on my radar. So 
I might, depending on when the games are, I might have to change my flight to fly in and fly out. We'll see. Either way, I'm very excited about, about going. Yes. And anytime you can have a conference in Florida, you have to go. Right? That's will what they be, do in these nice places. Will that be, oh, we were saying uh, we will be drinking Miami Vi. I think Miami Vi is the plural of Miami Vice. Yep. And Tropical Bros and Bird Dogs, we have to. We'll be, we'll be nice and comfy. All right. From Ryan Dietrich, this is the, what is it? Barron's Online Big Money Poll. Out of 130 managers polled, only 6% of their clients were bullish. 63% are neutral. 31% are bearish. So I, I guess you I can't have questions even really... about this. They're asking money managers to tell them how bullish or bearish their clients are. This doesn't really sound like a scientific survey. No, not. <laughs> Do you I, think I guess... your clients are bullish or bearish? Eh, let's go bearish. Yeah. So I guess that's why neutral is kind of the hedge there, but that, that is interesting. You, you would maybe want to know whether the managers are more bullish or bearish, but this is, these are more professional money managers as opposed to wealth management. But I, I don't know if, if we would ever even think about our clients being bullish or bearish, right? Hopefully they're bullish on the long term. Otherwise, what's the point of investing? But in the short term, you know, I, I guess it isn't everyone, matter. isn't everyone bearish in the short term, just like by the way human nature is who's like, yeah, uh, I'm bearish long term, but I'm actually bullish in the short term. It does feel like we're in some sort of middle ground, though, where people are really this whole year of kind of just waiting. I know stocks are up and we'll get into the Nasdaq being up a lot in a minute, but it, it seems like people are just kind of in the middle ground. Like, OK, the world didn't completely fall apart, but it doesn't mean that like everything is totally out of the woods. And so I think people being in the middle is it's kind of makes sense. But can so I, I looked, can, can I just say one, one more thing here? So. To this point about about uh, thirty one percent of their clients being bearish, then there's another question that says describe your current asset allocation, and it's sixty two percent stocks, twenty one percent bonds, nine percent cash, eight percent other. Doesn't sound like they're positioned too bearish. So watch what they do now, what they say, kind of thing. Always that makes sense. Yeah. So I I looked for a blog post at some of the worst years in the stock market history to figure out like what happened next year because we have had it doesn't always work like this but we've had 2022 seems like a completely separate time from 2023 and it's not like it it all of a sudden happened after December 31st things changed things were already kind of in motion in the fourth quarter of the year I guess but the Nasdaq Composite was down more than 32 percent last year and it's up through this was through Friday it was up 16 percent or so through the year. This is the composite, not the 100, because the composite, I have data going back to the 70s. So I looked at all the double-digit down years, and I think there were seven of them. And you can look at the, what happens the next year. Five out of seven years is a huge up year, right? Like 45, 50, 60, 30% gains. But then there's those other two years where you're down 20 or 30%. The, the S&P is actually pretty similar. There, there isn't much middle ground. It's usually after a really bad year, stocks go crazy or they continue to get slaughtered. So I guess the, the one thing would be like, if we're through the inflation crisis, then it would make sense that 2023 would continue to be a good year. If some sort of crisis or recession hits, then it would make sense for this to be another bad year. So I guess the, the range is so wide, but it, this crisis data actually what, like, makes like, sense. Like some, a couple of bank runs leading to a uh, uh, pullback in consumer credit like that. Don't you think it would have to be a recession at this point? I, well, I still can't tell. I'm, say, if no, if I'm, say, I'm saying that's, that's what leads yeah, to the recession. Right. Right, but I still can't tell if, if a very mild recession would end up being bullish for stocks, or if it would if things would just fall in line and the stock market would have to fall because of recession. I you could talk me into either scenario. Yeah. So I was doing some research on this, and I know the last three years or whatever seems pretty nuts. And you shared this morning on Slack how you're just going through everything we've been through in the last like three years, and it's it's a lot of stuff. But just from the stock market perspective, I looked at 1995 to 2003 for the Nasdaq. Look at these returns. Up 40, up 23, up 22, up 40, up 86, down 39, down 20, down 31, up 51. Man. This is all in consecutive years. There wasn't a single year where you didn't have a plus or minus 20% gain or loss. That's hard. I guess the point is, like, it, it seems like the current situation is, is like, unprecedented in, in some ways it is. In other ways, like, markets have been just as crazy or crazier than this. Uh, we've been speaking about international markets. And... Um... In, in Canvas's quarterly review, they broke down some of the fundamentals of U.S. developed and emerging markets. This is in local currency, inflation adjusted, from December 2021 through the present. And wouldn't you know it, 
U.S. is underperforming in a fairly significant way. These are just fundamentals from the past uh, 15 months or whatever it is, 16 months. Uh, sales growth in the U.S. up 8%. Developed markets, that's 16. Emerging, that's 10. Earnings, U.S. down 5%. Developed markets up 15. Emerging up 4. And profit margins, similar story there. Pretty interesting. I never, I never would have guessed this for the sales and earnings of... Because this is local currency too. This not like so. This isn't like and, a and, dollar and, story. And inflation adjusted. Yeah. Uh, well, but but to that point, I, figured, I don't know. Who, I don't know who posted this chart, but it's from Bank of America. It's a chart. The U.S. dollar has begun fourth bear market over the past fifty years. That's what they're. You know, that's where they're saying this is going. We'll see. But in previous regimes of dollar weakness, uh, these this is this is big potential macro implications. Like if there were to be a dollar bear market, this is a big deal. The funny thing, yeah, the funny, th and that would probably mean more international performance. The funny thing about it, if you look at it over the long term, over 40, 50 years or so, the dollar moves around a lot, but then kind of gets back to where it started. Like there, there's a huge peaks and valleys along the way, but then it just kind of goes nowhere over the long term, right? It's, it's, it kind of comes back to that center line there. All right. Connor Sen had a good, we've been talking a lot about demographics lately. We're getting questions on it. A lot of stuff with boomers and millennials. Everyone kind of just glosses over Gen X because, I don't know, no one cares about Gen X. And I think Gen X actually kind of likes that, right? They like to be the forgotten generation. So Connor Sen says, we felt the vibes when millennials were fighting to get jobs and apartments in the 2010s. We see it now how it feels when millennials are fighting to buy houses. Their urge to buy stocks is still five to 10 years away. But when that happens, you won't be able to buy the S&P sub 20 times EPS. My initial inclination is to say that he's probably right that the demographic wave of millennials when they start hitting those stock market years in you know 40s and 50s probably and really buying that the boomers didn't completely cause the 80s and 90s bull market but they had they were a big part of it right now the other hand the other side of this would be well wait wait, wait. we have we have boomers kind of canceling them out right the boomers will be selling as the millennials come become buying so it's not going to push things up as much but Remember my, what was it, 2018 or 2019? I went out of the limb and said, we're going to have a housing shortage in the 2020s. Remember my call there? Uh, I do kind of think that like, the millennials could have that same impact on the stock market. And you'll see just an, a continued upward trajectory in valuations, and people will say, I don't get it. This makes no sense. I think, I think there's a good chance that happens. I wouldn't pound the table on it. I like the idea. Uh yeah, I'm not sure. I don't really have strong feelings on this. It's definitely an interesting take. I wish I like had more here, but I just don't have strong opinions. I guess I would ask uh, Connor: Is this via automatic deposit, automatic uh, uh, purchases, like through the 401k, or because I don't really see like a whole generation of people having this sort of like uh, rush? I think for that the is. Stock I think market. that's. I think that's but a that, big part of it. But that, but that, but that, what I just said could be a huge part of it. Like. What is the purchasing power for the millennial generation? I don't know if there's 70 million of us as we come into our peak earning years. Yeah, my, now, my whole thing is that this this ahead. might this might sound like an obvious question or a question with an obvious answer. Um, and it's maybe an existential question, but like, does does the relentless bid put a floor in stocks? I just don't know that I'm there yet. I don't know that, yeah. that that can be. I don't know if that can be prov proven or disproven. It can be disproven with the lost decade, but I don't know how you like prove that. You know what I mean? I do understand why so many people are thinking through this demographic stuff, though. Like we, I've written about this. We've, we've we've just we've never seen a generation as large and wealthy as the boomers live as long as they're going to, and then you have the millennials kind of coming up behind them. And Gen X is just as wealthy too. We we saw last last week that in the generational. Uh, comparables. So it, it does matter. Robert Schiller in one of his books talked about this and he, he kind of said like, listen, demographics is one of the easiest things to map out. You're not exactly right. But so if, if everyone knows the demographic stuff is coming, don't you think the stock market would price that in already? So I, well, I kind of, I do have strong I, feelings I kinda, about this. Yeah. I have strong feelings that any argument that the boomers are going to dump their stocks on the market is very misguided. Because yes. will there be some boomers that need to so I don't even like calling them boomers. It sounds very pejorative. I don't like that. Will will our parents need to sell stocks to pay for their living expenses? It yeah, it's funny I'll, how just just saying boomer sounds like it's a bad thing, but that's literally the their nickname. No, I know. I just I don't like it. 
Um, yes, of course, a lot of parents will sell stocks to fund their living expenses. But guess who owns the stock market? Like, who really owns the stock market? It's really it's people with a ton of wealth. You think Great Jeff people, Bezos yeah. or maybe not Bezos? Maybe you think Bill Gates is going to be selling down his Microsoft stock to pay for his uh, his golf club or his golf country club? No. So I, I don't I don't buy that argument at all. I don't either. It's because the ten percent owns ninety percent of the stocks, right? Right, and that's either going to be passed down. Yeah, it's not all going. Those to stocks are once. those stocks are never getting sold. Another good chart from Apollo. I I do think that even if things slow down, and like we things have to cool off a little bit, households are in so much better shape. We've talked about this a little bit. But there's a couple charts in here I want to look at. So one of them is U.S. household balance sheets. Uh, this is household leverage ratio of liabilities to net worth. It's coming up a little bit, but look at how look at how much higher it got in the last crisis, and how it's just been in a straight line down ever since then. As people have repaired their balance sheets, obviously a lot of this is housing market and stock market related. Here's another one: mortgage debt uh, as a percentage of potential GDP. It peaked in you know 2008 and has come down ever since. I, I think this is the thing that people don't get: is that like the the net worth stuff has gone up so much for so many people that the liabilities have not kept pace at all with the assets. And that puts people in a really good place to weather any storm, even if we do get a mild recession. And, and I think that's why, like, if you're calling for a recession, that has to be your baseline, unless something goes horribly, horribly wrong. So how do we get a horrible recession? <sighs> the, the fact that the housing market didn't really do it or hasn't done it yet, that would have been my... My inclination is mortgage rates go to 7%. The housing market falls off a cliff. That's how you get a pretty nasty recession. The fact that that hasn't happened, it would have to be something complete. I don't know, something completely out of left field that I couldn't even think of right now. Think about how much has been thrown at us. So you mentioned that thing that I'm writing. Let me just read it to you. This was sort of like, holy shit, when I wrote this. Not that we didn't know it, but just to write all of this down. Uh, the economy has been through Sorry, I'm reading myself. Uh, the economy has been through a lot over the past couple of years. We turned it off and turned it back on again like we were restarting a video game. A combination of fiscal stimulus and supply chain disruptions led to an inflationary spike not seen in over four decades. All the ports and stuck in Los Angeles wreaked havoc on many consumer-facing companies. Semiconductors were in short supply. Used car prices went through the roof. By the way, remember 2022? How much time do we spend on the earnings calls of Walmart and Target worrying about their inventory? Was that going to cause a recession? I might have written I was a post gonna I might have written a post called Recession during the inventory stuff. Do you remember that? I was going to say that in our Google Doc, we always add uh, categories every once in a while. Supply chain is one of them. I think we get rid of it now. Like, it's I think still, time it's to get still, rid of it. Oh, I thought we did. It's still there? It's still there. I think we got to get rid of it. Um, all right. Amidst all of the chaos, Russia invaded Ukraine, which sent energy and commodity prices vertical. To slow all of this down, the Federal Reserve undertook a historic increase in interest rates, basically straight up for the last year and counting. That caused the housing market, at least the existing one, to all but freeze over. It also caused several financial institutions to mismanage their interest rate risk and led to some of the biggest bank runs this country has ever seen. Rising interest rates destroyed any appetite for risk-taking, with tech being at the epicenter of, of the enthusiasm unwind. Venture funding dried up. IPOs ground to a halt. And even mega-cap tech companies were forced to do mass layoffs. Along the way, the S&P 500 fell 25%. And the NASDAQ 100 lost more than a third of its value. The $3 trillion office real estate market is going to experience some pain over the next few years with occupancies down and borrowing costs up. And the cherry on top of this disgusting Sunday is the looming contraction in credit. It's wild that we've experienced all of this and still we're not in a recession. It's pretty insane. Yes, it is. And, and some people would say, oh, of course, because the government printed trillions of dollars. That's why we didn't. But still... I remember when the Fed and the government was sending checks out and the Fed went to zero and the Fed did everything it did in the pandemic and everyone said, good luck. That, it's going to do nothing. You're pushing on a string. And we did it. Yes, it's, it, this could have been way, way worse. And that, that's, again, why it wouldn't surprise me if we go the rest of this year, no recession, and maybe into 2024, it, takes, it still takes a while for all that stuff to work out. Um, so... Oh, so this, th I'm trying to think of a segue here because I got nothing. Sorry, coming up blank. Uh, there's a chart from Vanda Research showing um, equity e and ETF purchases from individual investors. Now, the key to this chart is it excludes 
401ks, and other retirement accounts. So it's just brokerage money, after-tax dollars, in custodial accounts. So this is and, really how much people are moving on the margins, which makes sense because you're to your right the, to your relentless bid thing. The four hundred and one k stuff is going to happen regardless, and that right. So, so doesn't matter. Although, although maybe countering what I said earlier that those stocks are never getting sold, it really is the marginal buyer and seller of stocks. I mean, I don't know that I totally will disagree with what I just said ten minutes ago about the boomers not doing anything, but it is the marginal buyer anyway or seller. Look at look at this. They came in twenty twenty, and they haven't left. They haven't left, which is nuts. They're still buying. A ton. So there's like a, a small bars and then it spikes and the, spi the spike has stayed elevated. How do we explain the fact that we've seen a really nasty bear market? A lot of the stocks that these, that these, ET, that these uh, individual investors loaded up on got killed and yet they haven't, they haven't backed off. That is surprising. Can I, can I maybe explain some of this away by after finally seeing some losses, people went from mutual funds to ETFs since this is just ETFs? No, that, that, it, but no, that, that that's that's uh that's I don't know. No, but you're right. Th this this is fairly surprising. People came in and have not left yet. I haven't seen the new a new Gallup poll that shows that because you remember in the '80s it was like 20 percent of all households owned stocks, and it didn't take to the '90s so it got to 50 percent, and it's basically stayed at 50 percent since the late '90s, early 2000s. I I wonder if we've gotten any more bump up since then in these past three to five years, whether there are now more households in the stock market or not. Um, I want to talk about this real quick. Uh, so I, I started my career, every time I say that I laugh, but the first job I had in the financial services industry was at a life insurance company. And uh, so, I saw, so I've always been interested in the articles or the stories about tech companies replacing insurance agents. So this is in the journal over the weekend. A decade ago, technology startups were planning to steamroll the stodgy life insurance industry. They thought the glad handling or the glad handing life insurance agent who cornered customers at little league games and closed deals at the kitchen table was a relic. Snazzy websites and sophisticated analytics would re, uh, replace the one-on-one -on -one sales pitches and tedious application process that often involved a medical exam. The agents won the battle, and now the tech firms are courting them. Of seven startups that together raised more than $1.2 billion to sell life insurance directly to consumers, at least five now promote services to help agents sell policies. Um, let's, the the co-founder of a company called Sprout said, our vision was, let's modernize, the let's modernize the industry. He assumed they could sell policies without agents. As it turned out, many customers had health issues that disqualified them from the available policies, and only 30 to 40% of applicants made a purchase. Uh, many of the tech firms now better appreciate an old industry adage. Life insurance is sold, not bought. They, they got a quote from somebody in the industry who was like, I'm not surprised that this didn't work out given what we know about the need for people to really go in there and sell. And, and this is a simple but powerful idea. It's hard to disrupt any industry, let alone gigantic entrenched industries with technology from people who don't really know the industry. Outsiders that come in and say, well, there's got to be a better way. We could fix this. We could replace this. We could speed this up. If you have no domain expertise, I, I, might, be, I might be completely wrong here. Maybe, maybe some of the biggest disruptions have come from outsiders, but I don't believe that to be the norm. I think if you don't know the intricacies of an industry, it's very hard to come in there with technology and just uproot everything that's been built. I do think we've learned that technology has a really hard time disrupting the world of finance. Consumers, for sure, technology has helped, but the whole fintech revolution has not really unseated any of the big players. JP Morgan insurance, and Goldman Sachs. And insurance did seem so disruptable from, from, if you just were like, why wouldn't you just be able to click, clack, click, get your exam, boom, boom, boom. But uh, it's not that easy, apparently. Yeah, I think the the financial like banking and housing, the tech tech industry, tr the technology sector tried to come in and revolutionize it, and it just hasn't happened. Uh, back to our other thing, I, I did find the Gallup poll. This is from May 2022. It's gone from about 52% in 2016 to 58% now. So there has Wait, what been has, what has what has stock ownership. Uh, it's it's it hit 60% in 1998, and it and it kind of went down after 2008. And now it's back up to 58%. So it, it did dip after 2008. Now it's come back. Like the percentage of uh, 
people who actually own stock in some form, individual shares, mutual fund, ETF. So the last few years, it has seen an uptick in households owning stock, which it's a good thing. So we've spoken about the transcript before. They put together, they like do amazing compilations of earnings, which we're going to get into today. We've got a busy, busy week for earnings. We've got Google and Microsoft tonight and Chipotle is always in there. We had Spotify this morning. We had GM. We had McDonald's. Did you uh, still give up on Chipotle for lunch? I I mean, you can't because there's one literally next door to our office in New York. Well, it's funny you should, you should ask me. I haven't had Chipotle in probably four months. But on Sunday after the Nick game, I had to go back to the office, and I, ha- I had a burrito. Well, credit to you for going to the office on a Sunday. No, I, I left my bag there. I wasn't working. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, all right. This is from uh, Manpower Group. Which is I, I, you know what? I don't even want to speak out of turn. I feel like it's a temp like a, agent. It's like a temp you know, agency. I say employment agency. Okay. After months of a remarkably strong U.S. labor market, we are now seeing more companies across various industries recalibrating their workforces after a period of bullish hiring. Is there such a thing as bearish hiring? I guess it'd be bearish hiring, shifting their focus towards more intentional hiring for specialist skills, delaying hiring decisions, and reducing their demand. For, okay. All right. A little more selective. A little more selective. But uh, speaking of bullish. I was out, Robin and I went out to dinner on Saturday night. We went back to Park Slope, which is where we lived for a few years. Haven't been there in, I don't know, five years, maybe. Who stole, um, who stole the name first, Brooklyn or isn't Park Slope in Utah? Maybe. Who had it first? Okay. That's probably, I don't know. Can't you tell sent you. me a text the other night saying you were in Park Slope and I thought you were skiing in Utah or something. Uh, so I said, so I said, so we went to an excellent restaurant. We had, what do we have for, for, Apps, we had like... I'm an idiot. It's Park City. I'm an idiot. Okay. Disregard. Forgivable. We had an incredible burrata and then like fried like um, zucchini flowers or something with like prosciutto in the middle. I don't even... It was out of this world. And I said, based on these appetizers, I'm super bullish on my chicken parm. And she was like, bullish, (laughs) bullish hot. I don't don't know what what bullish means. I don't understand that reference. Yeah. And I was like, wow, you really, really don't listen to my podcast. Okay. So I was in New York last week for a couple days, and remember last week on the pod, I just said, I just can't understand how people can pay so much money to live in New York. And then we went out and walked around on Friday in like a sunny day. The night before, we went to like an amazing dinner. And then on Friday, we walked around, and we went to the West Village, and we went to one of our favorite restaurants there. And then I'm, I thought, okay, now I get it. We walked <laughs> through the parks, and it's like sometimes from the outside in, you can, you can think like, why would anyone ever pay this much to live in a place? It's ridiculous. You have a small place and it's it's crowded and all these things and it's not easy to get around and get stuff. And then you go experience all the good stuff about it and you go, okay, now I now I see why people do this. It totally yeah, makes sense. It was pretty it was a pretty special afternoon. Just the vibes of all the young people doing their thing. It was yeah, it was that was fun. Uh this is interesting. Uh Port C Capital tweeted narrative violation. Google gained search engine market share in Q1. How about that? I mean, do you know anyone who actually uses Bing or uses, I mean, people use chat GPT to search. They're not searching like they would on Google. I feel like it's two separate things. They may use it as a, as a tool to help them do stuff or learn, but they're not using it in the same way as Google. No, come on. Yeah. All right. Real estate. This to me is one of the, we we're talking demographics again, because that's, that's our MO lately, I guess. Apartment list has this has this uh, real estate update, and it's called the Millennial Home Ownership Report by Rob Warnock. I think we used some of this stuff before. This chart is amazing. Generational home ownership rates, 1985 to 2022. It shows silent generation, baby boomers, Gen X, and you can see they all go up into the red over time. Silent was already higher, obviously. So baby boomers are at a little less than 78 percent. Gen X is at like close to 70. Millennials are at 51 and a half percent. And I think if you don't assume that the millennial one is going to continue to go up and reach those other levels, then you're nuts. 70, 75%, something like that. It might take some people a little bit longer. And the, the crux of this article was saying how, why some people don't own a house as millennials. It's obviously unaffordable in some places and hard to buy and all these things that we've talked about. But this, you talked about a floor under stock market. I would be much more apt to put a floor under real estate prices because of this. I think Millennial household formation is just going to continue to happen, and this is going to move up. And in 20 years, it's going to be at 70, 75 percent. 
And I, I do think that the increase we've seen in the last three years is going to be looked at back as like this, this giant leap higher in housing prices. And unfortunately, that that's like the new permanent plateau for housing prices. Even if I we agree. continue to have a little bit of a correction here. Yeah, I agree. That was uh, one of my predictions of 2023 was that housing prices would not crash. And so far, so good there. One of the things that we forgot to mention last week that... Uh, oh, that was um, one of your top 10 predictions? No housing price crash? Yes. We didn't talk about last week uh, the, the, the housing stocks. Lennar, Pulte, home, uh, DR Horton. And shame on us. I, I, right after we actually, right after we stopped recording, I was like, damn it, I can't believe we forgot to mention that. They're all back at all time highs almost, right? So, or 52 week highs at least? I, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So it makes sense. This is not, people buying home building stocks are not dumb. Uh, they're reporting earnings and they're crushing it. I think if you just thought, if you just knew that mortgage rates would go up to 7% and that the housing market would essentially freeze, except for home building, uh, new construction. You would think that home building stocks would get crushed, right? They're pretty heavily correlated to mortgage rates. But, uh, and I'm sure some people nail this trade, but given that so many people were locked into their home with, I don't know if it's 60% of all mortgages under 4.5%, whatever the number is, that the only houses available are is new construction. And these, yeah. these, these companies are on fire and, and their stocks are reflecting that. Pretty wild. The only, with supply being so low, it's the only game in town. Yeah, it, yeah. I think home builder ETF is up like seventeen percent this year, so it's kind of in line with the Nasdaq. Here's another good one. I just had to mention this because it mentions uh, my hometown. So they looked at millennial home ownership rate by metropolitan area, the highest one on the, this list. Grand Rapids, and Michigan, at nearly seventy percent. And then you contrast that with Los Angeles and San Jose and San Francisco, which are all around thirty, less than thirty percent. Look at all these midwestern cities on here: Grand Rapids, Minneapolis, Cincinnati, St. Louis, Pittsburgh, Indianapolis, Detroit. It's all Midwestern places that have much higher millennial homeownership rates. Why? Because houses are actually affordable. More affordable there. Yeah. Come to the come to the flyover states, people. Uh, but yeah, that that generational homeowner chart is is great. Here's another one from Redfin, and Redfin kind of shows this at the same time. This is like the net worth one we looked at last year. So it shows actually Gen Z is right on track. Millennials are a little low compared to Gen X and Boomers, but uh, everyone kind of follows the same path in your 20s. And I think millennials. It makes sense that they're a little behind because of the 2008 crisis and people just going to school longer. But again, we're, we're kind of right on the same path. And if, this is another good one. Uh, what, pers- what age cohort, and they break them down by 10-year uh, cohorts, buys the biggest uh, chunk of houses per year, and it, breaks, it goes back to 2018. And you can see it's younger millennials. People 25 to 34 are the biggest buyers. The next one is 35 to 44, and they make up eyeballing it 50% of all purchases, maybe a little bit more. Well, I'm an older millennial and as such, I have to take a bathroom break. I'll be back in two minutes. All right, I'm back. I am cursed with a small bladder. It is what it is. Can't, you know, can't fix it. I am too. Have you, did you pass that down to your son? Because I did too. I I, I also have a small bladder. I pass it on to my son. He, He pees all the time. It's awful. Uh, before we move on to uh, great quarter, guys. Uh, Hang on. I got one more housing thing. Okay. All right. I do feel like these these headlines are right, but maybe not. Uh, not it's like a correlation causation thing. So why it pays to buy a house. Homeowners became 40 times wealthier than renters in the past decade. This is from USA Today. It showed that over the past decade, the median price home in the U.S. gained $190,000 in value, making the typical homeowner 40 times wealthier than if they had remained a renter, according to a new report. And they're showing these, these different areas where how much you made. And a lot of these, these studies will show that if you own a home, you're much wealthier than someone who rents. And I, I do think that just because I, I think there's a disconnect there that like, if you don't buy a house, you can't become wealthy. I think it's just because for most people, that is their biggest financial asset. And it's gone up a lot. So that helps. But I don't think it necessarily means like if you rent, you're not going to build a high net worth. I don't, I don't really subscribe to that, that like you have to buy a house if you want to be rich, right? Like that's the next step you have to take. Yeah. I think the thing is though, if you live in the suburbs, you just, there's not, you got to buy a house, yeah, right? For the yeah, most that, part. That, 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 that's the thing. And so in Grand Rapids, it said 70% of millennials own homes. There's not a big rental market here. There's right. like, if you wanted a house, there's nowhere to rent. But here's the thing though. So 
this is different than having a portfolio of stocks or having a bunch of money in your savings account. Like, how do people use this wealth, right? Like, a lot of people say, like, great, your housing price went up, but now if you want to move into a new house, then you have to pay a higher price. I mean, obviously, you, you could trade down or whatever, and you can borrow against it. I do think owning a house and having wealth in your home gives you greater flexibility. Like, we've, we, you and I have used our home equity line of credit uh, occasionally to, to do stuff, and I get, think it gives you financial flexibility, but besides using it as a new down payment on a new home or potentially having it paid off someday, I don't think the wealth in your home, it's just not as easy to access or do something with as other forms of wealth. It's, very, it's a little more restrictive. So I, I do think having this is great for people, but then how do you actually tap it? And how do you use it to your advantage? I think that's I'm the problem for a lot of people. I'm doubling down on my take that I made a couple of weeks ago about a mansion not necessarily just being about the square feet of a house or square footage. When we were in Hershey Park, we were uh, there's a there's a road there called Mansion Road, and those were mansions. You know why those houses have to be five thousand square feet or more? Well, I'm sure they. I mean, they looked at they were they were big big houses, but they all had very very nice plots of land. Yeah, I, I, that is part of it. If, if you have an outdoor space that you can use, that's like additional square footage in your house. I agree. Uh, all right. So I was looking at, I want to, we're gonna start with American Express. And also wait, I just want, I want yeah. to put this out there for you. Uh, you told me last week that your, your, your grass just gets eaten alive by what your dog or your kids or something. And you were thinking about putting AstroTurf in. And I think I would love to do that someday, but I, I don't, I don't ever see it happening. Why? I mean, it's, it's not cheap. I'm, I'm getting a quote. I got a quote, which is, it's too much. I'm probably not going to do it, but I'm going to have somebody come to the backyard just to see. I don't have like but a fenced my, off my, area like you do. My, my uh, yard is open and it's much bigger, not, not to brag, not I have a brag. way bigger yard than you. <laughs> <laughs> but wouldn't it, I mean, don't you think it'd be kind of funny if like your neighbors had grass and then you just have like right up to their grass, you have AstroTurf yes. going in? Yes, yes, It'd look yes. weird. But, but my, my backyard grass got destroyed in the hurricane. So it's just, it's, it's like, uh, it just, it's blotchy. It's like a, it's like a, it's like a man's beard that has like gaps in it. You know what I mean? It's just, so I, I, at the very minimum, need to resell because it just looks, looks awful. But anyway, um, maybe I'll put that on my credit card. Speaking of American Express, see what I did there, Ben? That's a, that's a pro move right there. This is interesting. The year over year in consumer services build business. Boomers are up 8%. The Gen Xers are up 14%. Millennials and Gen Z up 28%. On, on Amex, those are earners. I swear you had this chart in here last week. No, I didn't. They just report. No, it was, uh, it was bank. Who was we last week? We had a lot of banks last week. It was Bank of America. Keep up. Oh, bank. but I feel like the numbers were similar though, right? Okay. Well, maybe I'm just noticing trends here. I'm spotting trends left and right. And you look at, the, there's another chart showing card member loans and card member receivables credits metrics. So 30 days past due and corporate net write-offs. And yes, they are climbing, but- well below pre-pandemic levels. How about that? In pre-pandemic, 2.2% were, were 30 days past due. I'm sorry. 2.2% uh, were either 30 days past due or, or were write-offs. That was 1.2% last quarter in the, in the fourth quarter, 1.6% in the, in the first quarter. So it's rising. But again, 1.6% versus 2.2%. The consumer's all right. Yeah, still doing better than we were. And and honestly, pre-pandemic, things were just fine too. Not like the economy is falling off a cliff in 2019. Hardly. Hardly. Right? So it's it's not a bullshit comp. This, I have, this, you got this, Amex stuff pulled up here. I, I did trade in my Chase Sapphire Reserve. I wasn't getting enough out of it for an American Express gold, silver, platinum something, whatever the American Express one is. I like it so far. I get Uber point or I get picks up Uber for me. I did the clear that you mentioned to me in New York where they scan your eyes. Pretty clear is great. Yeah, it's great until you realize that the TSA pre-check line is way shorter than the clear. But I had to do it anyway just because I went out to scan my eyes for me. Uh, how's Ben? How's this for elitist? I have both. So do I. Because <laughs> I don't. I clear is only. I don't have clear in Grand Rapids, right? It's right. only at bigger airports. Uh, although the T. I mean, I don't know how much clear is. I don't know, but the, uh, you probably get a promotional deal for what hundred bucks. The, the pick up the your whole clear through the Amex, one hundred eighty nine bucks a year. And pre check good. is pre check is nothing. It's just a mild pain in the butt. 
You had to go to Staples yeah. to get, but whatever. Well worth it. Um, all right. This blew my face. So if you look at their expenses, the card member rewards, $3.8 billion expense for the first quarter. Wow. I would love to know how much of that never gets used. Like kind of like, a, you know, they always say like at the holidays, a certain like millions or billions of dollars in gift cards never get spent, whatever the number is. I, I think that's what that a, is for, no, for credit cards. No, I think, but I'm not positive. I think that's a direct expense. I think that, that that's actually okay. what was hit and used. You know what okay. I mean? Like if you used Amex points to buy a plane ticket, yeah. I think that's what it's talking about. I could be wrong. Uh, they also have another chart showing tra- travel and entertainment build businesses. Uh, year over year restaurants up 28% lodging, 31% airlines, 60%. People are still doing the damn thing. Still doing it. Have you seen airline tickets come down? I've at least seen airline tickets level out a little bit. They're not going gotta, up anymore. Actually. Yeah. My flight to Hollywood to Fort Lauderdale was uh 350 bucks. That's which not is, bad, which is very reasonable. Uh, all right. First Republic reported last night. This is, this is not great. Um, the stock is down another 27% this morning. I just want to read from what Bloomberg posted uh, from, I guess, the bank's earnings. The recent industry events beginning in March 2023 have impacted the bank's funding sources. As of March 9th... who it's down almost 30% now. Is that... As, have they, like, cleaned house at all at that bank or not really? Uh, I'm not going to say that I just said it was down 30, 30% because I, I, I don't, we don't do that here. We don't call each other out for not listening. That's not a thing that we do. Um, they are doing layoffs. So as of March 9th, total deposits were $173 billion, down 1.7% from year end 2022. Then on March 10th, following the highly public closure of a large regional bank, First Republic began experiencing unprecedented outflows. On March 16th, First Republic received uninsured deposits totaling $30 billion from a group of America's largest banks. Blah, 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 blah. Um, all right. They say deposit activity began to stabilize beginning the week of March 27th and has remained stable through Friday, April 21st. Total deposits were down only 1.7% from March 31st to April 21st. So, all right. And they said that also reflects like seasonal tax stuff. So as far as this report lays out, the the rush has subs- has subsided. This stock met, uh, hit its all-time high in November of 2021 down 95% since then. It's a Jeez. lot. And uh but I think total deposits are down 40%. So yeah, not good. Not good at all. Um all right, General Motors on Tuesday raised key guidance for 2023 after reporting first quarter results that topped Wall Street's top and bottom line. Is that good? A beat and raise? Yeah, that's pretty good. Look at this chart Ben, of their EV sales. They went from a 0.3% market share in the first quarter of 2022 to 8.4% four quarters later. That's wild. I assumed I would be getting an EV for my next car, which is like 2024-ish. We talked about this with a car dealership guy. I think it might be the next one now. I'm going to wait it out until they're a little cheaper. I think I'm going to wait till all these places get more online and they become closer to the gas-powered cars. So I love my new Jeep Wrangler. I got the hybrid. I, don't, I think I spoke about this on the show. But it's got, so it's a hybrid, but it only has a 30 miles. You only get 30 the, miles the on the charge, 30 okay. miles, which, which is not great. And it takes 14 hours to get to a full charge, which is absurd. So I bought like the Jeep charger, which is not super cheap, but it, it cuts it down to like three or four hours. So the cost of the charger is basically the amount of money you save on gas a year, probably. Probably, probably. Uh, all right, Pepsi reported earnings. Uh, Buco, at, at Buco Capital, which is a good follower on Twitter, he said, wow, Pepsi just threw up 40% revenue growth on zero volume growth. And then Carl Quintanilla tweeted, Pepsi co-exec on pricing says, quote, with the pricing that we have taken already in most of our businesses around the world, that should be, that should be sufficient, end, end quote. I hope so. Look I'm at, paying like $7.99 for a 12-pack of Diet Pepsi now. Come on. So, Ben, you, you said that earlier that... Uh, the corporations were absolutely, absolutely yeah, taking putting advantage, their, putting their hand in the cookie jar or the honey pot. I don't know. They're doing something. I don't like it. Yeah, they yeah. So hopefully it sounds like it's it's relaxing a little bit and they're slowing down, but they, they definitely took advantage of this. All right. So we've got, as I said, we've got a, another busy rest of the week, but Bespoke tweeted, does this look like an earnings apocalypse of roughly 60 earnings results this morning? 
EPS beat rate, 77%. Sales beat rate, 73%. Companies raising guidance, five. Companies lowering guidance, two. I think S&P earnings are tracking for a 6% uh, decline quarter uh, year over year or something like that. So nobody's nobody's super optimistic about this this quarter, but so far, not bad at all. All right. Probabilities. Recession in 2023, 2024, 2025. What would your breakdown be? Okay. Mine would be like 10, 50, 40. All right, I, I'm not aligned with you at all. Uh, so for 2023, I would say 30. No, I'd say I'd say 35 for 2023. I'd say 55 for 2024 and 10 for 2025. I think there's a very okay. minimal chance that we push it out to 2025. Maybe I, I would I say 40, like, 40, 55, five, final answer, 40, 55, five. All right. I'm becoming more and more open to the idea of this thing just continuing to chug along. Maybe I'm Until 2025, right. Duncan, maybe, maybe a poll, maybe a poll. When will the recession yep. start? All right. Here's the survey of the week that I do not believe. All right. This is from Ernst & Young, Wealth Management Unit. Nearly half of millennials turned to cash amidst market volatility last year. By comparison, just 34% of Gen X and 24% of baby boomers sought safety in cash. There's no way. There's, they're kind of saying everyone went to cash last year, and then they missed the run-up in the SP, which is up almost 20% since the October lows. There's just no way that many people went to cash. What was the number? Half of all millennials in this survey. <laughs> this is, put up the cartoon of like who answers surveys, people, or 95% of people who answer surveys, whatever that cartoon is. This is just, there's no way. No. No. Nope. That would if that would have if if this many people went to cash, that would have caused a more severe crash. Yeah, come on. Uh, all come right, on. good one from friend of the show, Ramp Capital. He in his newsletter last week wrote about how got reached out to on LinkedIn. Someone, a recruiter, uh, talked about the job and said it could be an extra fifty to sixty percent in compensation if he takes the new job. Sounds great, right? But he said if he did it, he would have to go in four to five days a week to the job. In his current role, he has way more flexibility. He has young kids at home. And so he's he's weighing the options of, I could make way more money. I just bought a new house. I want to provide for my family versus, or I could say this other job. It's way more flexible. It pays less, but I get to work at home and I get to see the kids more and I get to do all this other stuff. And and he was saying, his conclusion was kind of like, well, it to me, it seems like the flexibility matters way more. And I think a lot of young people who went through this this period in the pandemic, I think a lot of mindsets have changed in that direction. Can I, can I say, but, 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 and, uh, flexibility is a luxury because you have to be at the point where your bills are good before you can get to that point. And I think most people that get to the point of financial freedom at that point, once they get to wherever they need to get to say, you know what, I'm good. $30,000, whatever it is, God bless, doesn't change my life. I'm just going to do what what is best for me and my family. I do feel like that no matter how much you make, though, if you said add 50% onto it, anyone would go, oh, yeah, I could handle making that. Like, the answer for how much do you need to make, it's always more, right, for most people. But I, but I'm, I'm just saying that I, I think this, it would be a different scenario if, if work from home and pandemic stuff never happened and someone offered you, Here's two jobs. Here's one with 50% more pay, but you got to in the office. And here's another one you can work at home. If you've never had that experience, I think you'd say, I got to take the pay for sure. And I think just the fact that we depends were forced where, into this. D- depends where you are in your life. Yes. Yes, I agree. It, the, the family thing is a big, big part of that. Having the flexibility with a family is. After, is, after, after spending time. So like putting my kids on the bus, like I wouldn't trade that for anything. But also I'm at, Again, like I've I've reached a relative comfort zone with whatever whatever the money would be. It's not as important as the things that are actually important. Yes, I agree. There there is a certain level you have to get to to be able to make that decision. But I think the decision would have been a lot easier in the past to go. Okay, you always take the money. By the way, I could hear younger people saying like, "Oh, it must be nice," and then older people saying like, "Yes, Michael and Ben are, are making sense." Yeah, that's right. It, it is. It's it's completely yeah. different depending on your. Your stage in life. Oh, uh, you know what, Ben? You're right. Let's get rid of the supply chain. It's over. I, th- I'm, I th- can't believe we're still there. 
Take it out. Uh, it's done. All right, so Jason Gay had this really good piece of the Wall Street Journal about participation trophies and youth sports crisis. And you've seen the blog post from people that say, like, these are the 10 books that changed my life. Or people will have a story about this professor in high school or college or teacher totally changed my life. I don't have any of those stories. Uh, I, 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 like, I've never really read a book that totally changed my life. Me Maybe either. I wish I had. You know, it's, it, I'm, it's so never... glad, I'm so glad you mentioned that. Every time I see those tweets, I'm like, oh, like, I don't. But yeah, I, now, now I feel better. Yeah. If it happened to you, great. I've never had it. I, ne I had pretty mediocre teachers my whole life. I never had a teacher I look back on and I go, that, that teacher changed my life. And I'm happy for people who had it. But I can look back and say that, like, I have many coaches in sports that changed my life. And I, I probably learned more playing sports than I ever did in the classroom. Like time management and performing under pressure and uh, things like discipline and all, all this, right? I learned more, it sounds like cliche, but it's true. So Jason Gay at the Wall Street Journal said that like the new move to more travel sports and stuff for kids is causing fewer kids to play sports. So it says, uh, the percentage of children six to 12 who regularly played a team sport dropped from 45% in 2008 to 37% in 2021. Yikes. And that drop was well underway before COVID. Participation fell to 38% in 2019. And he's saying, listen, there are a lot of good things. So my wife and I really want our kids to play sports. We got them in doing a bunch of stuff. And it's not because we want to like live vicariously through them. I already had my moment, whatever. I'm fine. Not to, not to brag. Yeah, not to brag. Uh, <laughs> But it's it's the stuff that you get from it. It's not like we're trying to have them like play professionally or play in college someday. It's just that like all the good things you get from teamwork and practice and and like, and I think it helps you stay out of trouble a lot too because you're so busy with it. But I think so. The the point of his article was this move to travel sports, which I have seen firsthand. My daughter's already in some travel soccer league at age nine, and it's not cheap, right? Before it's not like a rec a Y rec league. Like you have to pay money, you have to buy uniforms, you have to travel. It's and I think his point was that it's, it's boxing people out from and it's turning into like sports are turning into like a haves versus have nots thing, and I'm not a huge fan of that. The fact that we're it's making we're making it harder for kids to play sports. Yeah. It's uh, um, let let yeah. How much is it? Are we talking like like a thousand dollars for for a yeah, team? Probably something like that for a season. Yeah. Uh, I was I went to Kobe's parent teacher conferences last week. And he he uh, does speech because he he like can't really say his R's or L's that great. So uh, I'm sitting in the and this is the this is the elementary school that I grew up going to. And Kobe's got a little bit of spilkus, which is like ants in his pants, which I suffer from, suffered and continue to. And we're which sitting. Is why you you were in trouble all eighth grade, like you said last week? We're sitting in punch the entire the entire the entire uh, year. <laughs> We're sitting in the little classroom in the little de in the little chairs, and like I just felt such a flashback to like oh my god I don't know what I got like anxiety being in a classroom setting I just get like deeply uncomfortable and like the the uh, his like speech it said like uh, like Apple doesn't fall far from the tree I guess <laughs> it is weird <laughs> because she was like things. she was like I can't keep Kobe in his chair he's always like you know running around the you know the table yeah and I, back to my sports thing real quick. I don't, I don't say like, we're having so much fun with my daughter doing this, her soccer league. I just wish more kids had the opportunity. Like I, I wish that it was more inclusive. It wasn't so hard for people. Uh, it's a big time thing and it's a big, uh, cost for a lot of people. And, uh, but it is, it's so much fun. Like we had a tournament all weekend and oh, know, I have a question though, each other and Josh travels, Josh takes, uh, Justin all over Long Island for basketball. Why does it, why, why do they need to go so far? This That's is the question, question that I have. Yeah, this is the question I have. There's, there's so many kids in a city. Why can't they just play each other? And uh, I haven't got a, a good answer. Mo most of our, our games are in Grand Rapids, but we'll have some games like 45 an hour, 45 minutes an hour away. So it's not terrible. But I agree that they. It, that's how it used to be. You would play in a rec league, and all the kids in one city would play each other. And it's just it, whatever for whatever reason that that hasn't kept up. Ben, we got we got Chinese food on uh, last week when you were in the city. And I'm 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 already taking the L here. I'm already taking the L, so relax. But there the the general TSO is a TSOS. I think it's just TSO. It? TSO. So how do you how do you pronounce that? It's T S O apostrophe S. General yeah, okay. Sow's chicken. General and Sow's. You, you some, said, people, some people call it General Sows. What do I I say? General Chow. 
Yeah, you said, I think some people in, in the East Coast call it General Chows, and everyone in the office goes, what? No, no one says that. And you're like, no, come on, in New York, people call it General Chows, and everyone shot you down immediately and said, no, I think you've just been saying that wrong your whole life. In Roosevelt Field, there used to be uh, a Chinese restaurant at the food court. I think it was called Manchu Wok, unless I'm thinking of a different Chinese restaurant. And I would always order the General Chow chicken, and uh, apparently I've been saying it wrong my whole life, but I do feel like I can't be the only one. I, I have to have heard that from somewhere. Yeah, Actually, speaking I, of getting speaking of getting roasted for food, somebody emailed me. And listen, I'll I'll issue a correction here. Somebody issued uh, emailed us. Brisket has got to be done in a crock pot, which I guess is what I said last week. Something only a Yankee would say. When he says Yankee, I hear something else. But okay, I'll let it go. Uh, thanks for correcting him, Ben. Listen, my bad. You're right. Obviously, brisket is. Uh, a, I mean, that's like a staple of the barbecue I'm guessing world. That's some, I'm guessing he's from the South. I feel like people in the South take their brisket very seriously. Well, yeah. Um, so. Apologies, hand up. However, when I cook a brisket, I don't have a smoker, okay? So for me, it goes in the crock pot. But, but point taken, there are many ways to skin a brisket. You're almost there for a midlife crisis, then you can buy a smoker for your front lawn. That's, what millennial, that's a millennial midlife crisis thing. Yes. Yes, but I'm, I'm never smoking. That's not, that's not happening. All right, just one more on StubHub. I'm sorry, I just can't let it go. So there were tickets that were 345 to get into the Knicks game uh, on Friday night. And on StubHub, that goes from 345 to 446. It's look at so how bad those seats are, too. Awful seats. <laughs> look at that, but it, look I, at that again, view. The, the, they take the entire bid as spread, and it's so wide. Because if it's 345, again, the buyer pays 446. So you, the sticker price is 345. Oh, no. Actually, you pay 446. The seller's not getting 345. They're getting what? 280 or whatever it is? It's insane. Why can't the sports leagues themselves just cut out the middleman and sell directly? Why doesn't the NBA do this? And maybe it's too much of a pain in the butt of the NFL. Why don't they have their own ticket system that they do? Obviously, it's too much of a pain. You preach it to the choir. I don't get it. Uh, we, also got, we also got clarity on a button up versus a button down. And now I know. So thank you to the multiple people that sent this to us. Here's the deal. A button-down shirt is a shirt that buttons at the front and has a button-down collar where you've got, like, the collar buttons. A dress shirt with buttons on the front and no buttons on the collar can be called a button front or a button-up shirt, but shouldn't be called a button-down. I know I was thinking about this. I feel like we got 10 different answers on this one, just so you know. No, no, no. This is consistent. Okay. This is consistent. All right. Uh, recommendations. What do you got? All right, uh, Ramit Sethi from I Will Teach You to Be Rich fame uh, has a new show on Netflix called How to Be Rich. It reminded me, I watched the first two episodes or so. It's, it's kind of like his podcast, but just better produced. And it reminds me of, it's, and it's, I think it's cool that Netflix is doing a show like this about personal finance. It's him helping people get their finances in order. It reminds me of, uh, what's the HGTV show? Bar Rescue? Uh, House, oh. House Hunters. House Hunters. It of house, it's like that, that's the kind of like way the show is set up. It reminds you of like a House Hunters episode, uh, but in a good way, which means you can kind of put it on the background. I, I really like it. They had Alien on the Rewatchables last week, so I went down an Alien rabbit hole. They have them all on Stars or Hulu, one of those. I watched the first Alien and the second one, and then I put on Prometheus, which I forgot was kind of the prequel. Prometheus is such a good movie. I feel kind of underrated in this last decade or so. That's a great sci-fi flick. Love Prometheus. Aliens is my favorite franchise of all time. The scene where the robot is like stapling her shut. Robin's like, you've seen this a hundred times. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty gross. I, I was never a huge alien guy, but I, I, I like, I, okay, I like those movies, but I was ne it was never my thing, but I, I really like them. I think my dad showed me aliens when I was seven years old. Like okay, I definitely grew up on. Yeah. So that's how you got hooked on horror. And I saw the Fincher one. I saw that in theaters. I don't know what year that was. 94? David Fincher made F an Aliens movie? Oh, was that Aliens 3? Aliens 3. Okay. Uh, and it was, it, was a it was a debacle. But I, every Aliens movie since Alien 3, I've seen in the theater. We'll, ne we'll never miss. Keep them coming. Love them. All him. right, what do you got? Uh, all right, I was watching Beef on Saturday night when Rob and I were going to the train. We're, we're going to the city on the train. I was watching beef and I don't know how this happened, but I said to Robin, like, you're an idiot for not watching this. I told you to watch it with me. You're going to like it. I get mad at her for not watching stuff with me that I know, she, that I know she's going to like. And yep. she will never watch something that I recommend unless she hears like two of her friends recommend it. And then I'm like, but I, I, I'm, but I'm six episodes in. Anyway, I, I'm trying to convince her. I'm like, this is like really HBO quality. And 
I was probably on like the third episode or fourth episode. And I don't know how I didn't realize it until I said that. It's You know why it feels like HBO quality and not Netflix? Even, you know, uh, it's because uh, it was produced by A24. Oh, interesting. Okay. I've heard Did good things. I still haven't got into it. I haven't watched much TV lately. Okay. I, kind of, I don't know. I thought, I thought you watched it. I yeah. really, really enjoyed it. Uh, borderline pounding the table on it. I, I I thought it was I thought it was excellent. Definitely not very what I thought. It was very bullish on beef. Super bullish. Um, all right. Thank you for listening. Again, thank you to Matthew Matthew for taking us on this journey. Uh, animalspiritspod at gmail.com. We will see you next time.